Grace's son, maybe he lives there. Yeah, across the street. You're right. Yeah. And then Dave Mayhew. Yes. And then another Dave, but I can't think of his last name. I got written down in the schoolhouse. Is Dwight here? No. He's a little under the weather this morning. Do you need to sign these cards? Sure, I can sign them. Once for my land, I'll see them. Oh, right. Morning. Morning. Good 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 morning. It's good to see everybody here gathered in the church, church house. <coughs> Let's bow for prayer together, shall we? Father, it is such a privilege that you have provided for us that we as the church can gather in the church house. And we're grateful, Father, for the opportunity and still have the peace and security to be able to do that. In the times in which we find ourselves, we thank you for your continuous grace, mercy, peace, joy, and blessings. These are things, Father, that we neither earn nor that we deserve. But you, because of who and what you are, continuously pour these things out on us. As we gather together this morning, we ask earnestly, Father, that everything that is done this morning, in word, thought, and deed would be to your honor and to your glory. Enable us, Father, to continue to grow in grace and in full knowledge of our Lord, Savior, and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. For it's in his name that we pray and give thanks. And all of us together say, Amen. 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 We, uh, we have quite a bit to cover this morning by God's grace, uh, so uh, oh, that is good. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, do you want to uh, get together with John and have the music and we uh, go from there to Doing, doing the second week of the Hanging of the Greens? I, I would be overjoyed for John to go up there and play all the Christmas songs he wants to. <clears throat> and if we know him, we'll sing with him. And if, But please, we are just so happy to have you this morning, you. John. And it was a wonderful surprise to Blessing. have you. Yes. Blessing. I wish I could come way more often than I did. So do we. <laughs> so, so does this ailing pianist. <laughs> but as often as you come, we are grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. I love to come. Well, you just play any and everything you want to play. Well, I have, I think. Oh, okay, you've already got it. Thank well, you. I have it in the general vicinity. Okay. Okay, well, we can start on 217 because we got a little one here. Might like to hear away in a major. Okay. This is already on? Yes. She's already singing it, bless her heart. 217. Okay.
218 or a couple verses? Just a couple of verses. Okay. Be fine. So 218, what, the first and the last? Yeah, that would be good. Okay. Thank you. Around here. <clears throat> Do they have angels we have heard on I'm sure. Okay, 2.30 is their little town of Bethlehem. That's oh, great. that's wow. that's one that I was... 2.30. Yeah. yeah. First and oh. last. Yeah, yeah. Okay. whatever you want. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. <clears throat>
Okay. Well, okay. Just don't go away, please. Okay. Thank you, John. There we go. You're welcome. A pleasure. What do we do? Did you print that out, babe? Yes, I did. We, uh... This is the first candle, right? Yes. Last week, we did the full hanging of the green service, and it was just magnificent. Sue outdid herself, and I'm so sorry that she's not here today. But um, I will refresh your memory on uh, the first candle, which Mitch is lighting. Uh, it's called the prophet's candle. The prophets of the Old Testament, especially Isaiah, waited in hope for the Messiah's arrival. The color purple symbolizes royalty, fasting and repentance. And the scripture was, Isaiah 9, 2, and 6 and 7, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now week two is preparation or waiting or prophecy. It's called Bethlehem's candle. Micah had foretold that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which is also the birthplace of King David. Isaiah 40, 3 to 5. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So we have now lighted two of our four Advent candles. Thank you. You're welcome. You're a fine job. Thank you. Pastor. Glad you came today. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> The Word of God is alive and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divining asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a judge or discerner of thoughts and intentions of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be fully equipped unto all good works. Let's open God's word this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. John, chapter 19, the Gospel of John. Before we get started this morning, let, let's take just a few moments to gather our thoughts and to concentrate on the inerrant word of God. <clears throat> Let's bow together, shall we? Father, again, it is such a pleasure and an honor for us to be gathered as the body of Christ, gathered in the church house, the saints, 
because of who and what you are, not because of who and what we are. There is so much, Father, on our hearts and on our minds, and as we look into your word this morning, we ask God the Holy Spirit to grant us enlightenment, to teach us and show us, enabling us to continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. All of us together say, Amen. 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 John chapter 19, the Gospel of John. I'll give you a verse here in just a minute. Um, John chapter 19, starting at verse 31. Uh, just a way of review. We, we have been studying for the past few weeks the resurrection and without a doubt we focus on the fact that without the resurrection there would be no gospel and without the resurrection we as the body of Christ would not have salvation we have examined this from history from logic from theology and now we're looking at it from an eyewitness perspective the eyewitness account was the solid most solid evidence as far as the courtroom is concerned out of all the evidence eyewitness because the individual that was doing the eyewitnessing was the one who was actually and realistically right on site. And so what we're looking at this morning, uh, due to time constraints, we'll cover as much of this as we can this Sunday. And then we'll pick it up again next Sunday. <clears throat> but the objective here right now is uh, the caring for the physically dead body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, physically dead, I emphasize that. Spiritually alive, as far as the deity is concerned, totally 180% alive. As far as soul and spirit are concerned, you can in no way destroy it the soul and the spirit. You can destroy the physical, but the soul and the spirit, that's who we really are. So, there were two individuals that were actually caring for the physical body of our Lord. I want to emphasize something here. There were four individuals that were extremely uh, cognizant of the fact and their lives were changed as things transpired between the time that our Lord went to the cross and his physical body was taken off the cross. The first was the criminal that was next to him. There were two of them. And he said to the Lord, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Immediately, he got a reply. You will be today with me in paradise. What was that young man saying to Christ Jesus? He sought salvation and he found it. He knew without a doubt that he was speaking to the only one on this planet at that time that could say to him, Definitely, today, you will be with me in paradise. The next one was the centurion, who after everything was said and done, this was a Roman Gentile centurion. He probably was the one who was in charge of the things that transpired there with the other soldiers. 
But he made the statement that this was the Son of God. But he failed to realize, or at least he didn't acknowledge that, yes, this was the incarnate Lord Jesus. He was, he is, and he is the one who is to come. And he always was. So when he said, from his perspective, from what he saw, that changed his entire outlook on his life. Because he himself also knew that this individual nailed to that cross, went to that cross to provide for him what we also are the recipients of. So great salvation. And that's why he said this was the Son of God. The other two individuals are the two individuals who took the physical dead body of the Christ off the cross. And so we pick it up at verse 31. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies were <clears throat> would not remain on the cross, the Sabbath would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, asked Pilate that the legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Well, why would you break the legs? Because of the fact the physical body, the lower legs and the, the knees could no longer push up and allow these individuals to breathe and they would physically die of suffocation. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other one who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the one of the soldiers pierced his side with a, with a spear. And immediately, blood and, and water or serum came out, which immediately indicated the serum and the blood coming out indicated the individual was physically dead. Verse 35, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. Now, let me emphasize this, what it says. It says, he who has seen has testified. Who saw and who was there? John. You also might be remember, you might remember that out of all of the, out of all of the disciples, John was the only one standing at the foot of the cross along with the mother uh, of Christ, mother of Mary and Mary Magdalene, women from Galilee who had followed, followed the Christ. Then it goes on to say, and, he, and his testimony is true. Yes, it is. Because his testimony is eyewitness. He saw what he is writing. And he's amplifying that by saying, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you or we also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture saying, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. You'll find that in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. <clears throat> Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but 
a secret run, one for fear of the Jews. Who is this young man? Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was the number of approximately 70 individuals that were well educated and as we said last week, well healed. They were wealthy, very wealthy, deep pockets. But however, he's, <clears throat> he says, being a disciple of, <clears throat> of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews. What was the fear? That they would be uh, eliminated and cast out of the synagogue. That they could no longer operate as a part of the, the Sanhedrin. And perhaps even it would cost them their lives. You see, in the early days in which the Christ and Joseph and Nicodemus and the other individuals, this is the early church. These individuals had no use at all, no use, zero, for the Christ Jesus that they had just nailed to the cross. As far as they were concerned, they had eliminated a source of irritation that would, would uh, be an encroachment on their power, their power. This was their political power because these individuals were the church leaders, the nation leaders at the time. And Jesus, Jesus was a threat. Why? Because the people were eyewitnessing what Jesus was doing as far as signs and wonders and miracles, etc. And the Sanhedrin, was, they did not like that. And so they plotted continuously to eliminate what they felt was a threat. And so we come down to this where Joseph asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Verse 39, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came. Myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds worth. Now, Nicodemus was also a part of the Sanhedrin. What they were doing, the two of them, was extremely dangerous for them. It was expensive because this mixture of, of myrrh and aloes was expensive. And as far as them receiving or gaining anything out of this, no, no. They were burying what they considered the Messiah. And these are the things that would, would transpire. So, we go on to verse 40. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in, in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. So what did they do? They washed the physical body, and then they applied in layers these spices, mixed spices. And then the entire body was covered with these linens. And then the body, physical body, dressed in the grave clothes as it were, was placed in the tomb. Now, we'll elaborate on that in, in just a little more uh, from a different uh, passage. But this, <clears throat> in verse 41, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there in the tomb. 
the day of preparation, celebration of Passover, the feast. There were literally hundreds of people all over Jerusalem. This was one of the mandatory feasts. But every young man over the 12 and older had to be there. Everybody was there as it were. And yet, with all of the preparation, because the Sabbath was coming, they had to get rid of the Christ. Because, as we said, the Christ was a threat. Fast forward to the 21st century. And here we are in the 21st century. And here we are as the body of Christ. And all across the stretch of our globe, the body of Christ is being persecuted in one respect or another. The things that have transpired and are transpiring right now, say in places like Africa, primarily Nigeria, where people are being murdered uh, for one simple reason. They're doing there what we are doing here. They are looking at the inerrant word of God as we are right now, and it costs them their lives. For some reason or other, other than the fact of it has to be satanically influenced, our so-called culture has decided that Christianity has to go. The Christian people have to be marginalized. They have to be set off to the side because basically they don't agree with what we have to say. Jesus didn't agree what the saying that he agreed. And the Pharisees and Sadducees had to say either. And it cost him his life that we might have salvation. And that Joseph and Nicodemus would be his pallbearers. Things haven't changed a whole lot. The body of Christ is still seen as a stumbling block. And not only that, there's a frontal assault on the things that are in nucleus of our nation, marriage and family. And we have said numerous times, when you destroy a family, you destroy a marriage, and you will ultimately destroy a nation. There is a frontal assault, and I, I emphasize that, on marriage. God ordained marriage, and it's between one man and one woman, period. You can play all kinds of games if you want to with it, and unfortunately, uh, these things are transpiring in our leadership. Something, something called uh, redefinition of marriage. How can you redefine what the sovereign God has put together as marriage? How in your arrogance and false pride can you possibly think that you can tamper with something that a sovereign God who created the entire universe, I might add, without mistakes? So what is it that you think you want to redefine? A satanic influence. Nothing short of a satanic influence. And that's what we're dealing with. In the 21st century, it was the same thing that they dealt with in the time of Jesus. Satanic influence. But our God is a sovereign God. He doesn't answer to anybody. There never was a time when he did not exist. He's eternal. And the love of God, we can't even fathom that. That's called agape love in the Greek. And how would I emphasize that other than saying that if you're breathing in and out, and we are, you have been loved by the grace of our sovereign God. Because 
The Greek word is theonoustos, and it means God breathed. It was the breath of God that was blown, as it were, into the physical body of Adam. And from that, the first Adam, the last Adam, who they are about to put into the tomb, went to the cross. And from that, we're still breathing. So no matter how much they might try in their satanic influence, you cannot change what the sovereign God has sovereign God had designed and put into place. There will come a time when our sovereign God will return. We don't know when. And the time aspect of it doesn't matter. He will call from the clouds and all of the body of Christ, all of the body of Christ will go forth to meet him in the air. That's what we're looking for. It's going to come. It doesn't matter when. If you're ready to go as we should be, time is not the emphasis. We are waiting for the imminent return. That's the emphasis. When he comes, we're out of here. And history will be suddenly changed. <clears throat> we have so much to be grateful for. And here we are in the second week of Advent. And we're, we're, we're mentally thinking Christmas, the birth of Christ. And that's justifiable. That's absolutely right. We should be. We should be focusing on the birth of Christ. Because where we stand right now, both the womb and the tomb are both empty. And that for us and to us is extremely gratifying. Nothing, nothing on this planet will prevent the Christ from coming for the church. Mm -hmm. The same way nothing on this planet prevented the birth of the Christ. May God bless us one and all. And without a doubt, may we all be ready when he comes. Yeah. He will come and we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then, although we are citizens of the United States of America, which is the most fantastic nation on the globe, we are really citizens of heaven. And when he comes, we're going home. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have provided for us to look into your inerrant, immutable word. We pray, Father, that the time that we have spent and gathered here in the church house will be a time of challenge and blessing. Enable us, Father, to be continuously concentrated and focused on who and what you are, not who and what we are. You are the sovereign, righteous, just, eternal love and holy God that we serve. You are omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And we know, Father, that you have said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And we know without a doubt, Father, that you are here with us. And so, we ask that everything that has been done thus far in our service would be to your honor and to your glory. Enable us, Father, to continue to grow in grace 
and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. John, would you like to give us a hint? Another go well. Which part was that number? Judy? It what was number did you have, huh? 238. 238. Okay. Carolyn found it. Okay. So I get warmed up. Okay. <laughs> Just a couple. Thank you for the privilege. 
that you have provided for us to be able to return that which you have entrusted to us as stewards. It's all yours, Father. And we the stewards, and we're grateful to be able to return it. Return it to your honor and to your glory. We ask your blessings on it, all of our gifts and tithes and offerings. And we ask that it would continue, Father, in the kingdom. We ask all of this, Father, in the powerful master's name of our Lord, Savior, and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. Praise, Praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.